Let's open our Bibles together to John's Gospel, chapter 4. We're going to continue a, a view of what was taking place last time we were together in chapter 4, where there's a conversation taking place between Jesus and uh, a woman at a well in a place called Sychar in uh, Samaria. I'll read verse 27 and uh, give you a bit of a review and then move into our study. We'll be looking today at the power of a testimony found here in this passage. So in John chapter 4, verse 27, John writes, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So we have been looking at a conversation that Jesus is having with a woman at a well in Samaria. And as we were looking at the first few verses of, uh, of this chapter, we saw that Jesus has been traveling from, from the south, Judea, to the north, a, a region called Galilee. And he's on his way arrived at a village called Sychar. It was noon. His disciples had left him so they could buy some food for lunch. And as he was seated there by this well, a woman came to draw water. And as she did, he spoke to her. Now, that's unusual because she was a Samaritan and he was Jewish. And John had made it very clear in verse 9 that Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. So she had expected him more than likely to walk away from her. But instead, he he looked at her, and as he looks at her, he begins to speak to her. Now, it's interesting to note that it's possible that she might at first have been, uh, well, she was, a, she was surprised that a man was speaking to her, but it's possible that she might have thought that he was trying to pick her up at first. You know, that does happen. People can mistake your friendliness in, in conversation. They can do that. It happens. I was just saved. I was 20 years old at the time. We, a friend of mine and I were in a place called San Luis Obispo. And uh, while we were there, we actually had gone to a, uh, to a pier in that region. And uh, there was a guy who was uh, catching uh, some crabs. He had set some traps and was catching crabs. And uh, as we had walked up, I remember he looked at us. It was just him on, the, on this pier and then my friend Jim and I walking up. And, and he looks at us and he says, what are you guys doing? And we said, oh, I, I, I had just gotten saved. I said to him, oh, man, we're just here looking at the beauty of God's creation. Now, at that time, hippies said that all the time. It didn't, you know, that wasn't something that, that was unusual to hear. But he looked at me and he says, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I am. He goes, out of sight. That was a word we used to say at that time. <laughs> he goes, so am I. And I said, really? And he said, and when did you get saved? Because that's how we would, that was our code. Because there are a lot of people who would say, oh, I'm a Christian. So the first thing we would say is, when were you saved? Because uh, a lot of times people were simply social Christians. And so we were of the Jesus movement. We wanted to know specifics. When were you saved? And so I told him, December 27, 1970. I said, I got saved at the Hollywood Palladium. He said, the Hollywood Palladium? I go, yeah. He goes, I'm a musician. His name was Tom. He goes, I'm a musician. He said, I was playing at the Hollywood Palladium December 27. I said, really? And he goes, yeah. So he was one of the guys up there who was doing the music in the Maranatha concert. And so we had a conversation before you know it. We're getting along like brothers, because that's what we are. And he says, listen, I caught a lot of, a lot of uh, crabs and all. Would you like to come? We're going to uh, open them up and eat them at my, my mother-in-law's place. And so we went with him, spent the afternoon. And he said, I've got a, um, a church that I'm playing at tonight. Would you guys like to come? So my friend Jim and I go with him to this small church in San Luis Obispo, 
And uh, as we're there, he's doing his concert for the uh, young adults, the college age or so. And uh, I'm in the back. And there's two girls who come walking up to my friend Jim and me. And they tried to pick us up. And uh, I still remember the conversation. I won't thrill you with it, but I do remember it. And they tried to pick us up. And, and I looked at one of the girls, and I said something like, Do you know the Lord? Have you given your heart to Christ? Because, I mean, here you are trying to pick me up. I mean, let's talk, woman at the well, let's have a conversation. So... <laughs> And when I said, do you know the Lord? I said, did you know that Jesus loves you? She started to cry. And she ran into, into the bathroom. So my, and one of her friends, because there were two of them. And my friend and I walked to the bathroom and kind of stood there till she came out. And walked outside with her and began, we wanted to share with her and all. And uh, somebody came out, one of the young people in the young adult study, because this young woman who came out from the study was trying to see whether we were trying to pick up this girl. And so from the very beginning of my walk with the Lord, I've discovered that sometimes people misunderstand you when you're sharing with them. Some of you ladies know that when you open up and share with a, a guy on the job or in the neighborhood, he might take it wrong. Some of you men know that if you share with a woman about the things of the Lord, they may take it wrong. It is possible for that to take place. And it is possible that this woman who had had six men in her life could very well have wondered whether this Jewish man was just being bold and just trying to pick up on her as Jesus was speaking. But as this is taking place, I want you to know something. At first, she begins to respond, and she responds abruptly, and she even speaks in a very direct fashion. Verse 9 says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? So she, at first, begins to speak in an abrupt fashion, and uh, that was fairly rude of her, but I want you to notice, Jesus didn't take it personally. And again, sometimes you may be sharing with somebody about the things of the Lord, and they may be abrupt with you, and they may be rude. Don't take it personally. Because sometimes we can get hurt feelings when people don't react nicely to us and the message. But instead of being insulted, notice that Jesus continued the conversation. And he appealed to a natural need, something that was obvious, because she was thirsty. And so in verse 10, he had said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And so he appealed to her natural need. She's obviously thirsty. You see, without drinkable water, the longest we can live is around seven or eight days maximum. She needs water. So he speaks to her concerning her need. But he's actually saying, you have a spiritual thirst that you're trying to meet with a physical substance. And physical food and water can never satisfy a spiritual hunger or a spiritual thirst. Remember Ecclesiastes 6, verse 7. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. Now, this woman has been searching for the perfect man. I wasn't born yet. No, this woman, <laughs> this woman was searching for the perfect man and had never found him. She'd already gone through six men. And it would seem for her, men were like a drug. They dulled the pain, but they didn't heal the hurt. Now, I want to point something out that I didn't point out before. I want you to notice that when Jesus was speaking to her, and he said to her, as we know in the conversation, um, you know, call your husband. She said, I have no husband. Remember, he had said in verse 18, you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. So that's six men. I want you to think about this for just a moment. In Scripture, there are times that numbers are used to communicate spiritual meaning. 
In other words, when you read your Bible, one is the number in Scripture of unity. It's called biblical numerics, by the way. One is the number of unity. Three is the number of divine perfection. Twelve is the number of government. Forty is the number used for testing. Six, six, six is the number of the beast. And so it's interesting in biblical numerics that the number six represents man. But the number seven represents completion or perfection. This woman had gone through six men. And now she's arrived at the seventh. What she was looking for was perfection in man. Went through six imperfect men until God, who had an appointment with her, met her so that she could find the man that she actually was looking for. The perfect man, Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus offered her living water, she immediately responded. She said, give me this water. But Jesus confronted her about her living arrangement. And when he did that, she changed the subject. And what did she do? She says, well, let's talk about religion. And she goes, my religion is just as good as yours. Well, the answer to that one is really, your religion is as good as Jesus's. Well, if that's the case, why are you still thirsty? There are people that will tell you, my religion's good enough for me. You know it if you share your faith. If you speak to anybody about faith in Christ, you will eventually, if you haven't already, you will hear somebody say, well, my religion satisfies me. But very often it's being spoken by a person Who's, who's, who's obviously not satisfied in life, who's obviously not filled with joy, obviously not filled with peace, obviously isn't walking in the Spirit of God and doesn't have the love of God in them. And yet they'll say, well, my religion satisfies me. No, it, no, it doesn't. Because if your religion did, you wouldn't be thirsty. And when Jesus was speaking to this woman and he said, I can give you water and you'll never thirst again, she says, well, give me this water. I want it. But she wants to argue religion. But if the religion that she was practicing was really satisfying to her, then why is she still thirsty? And so Jesus doesn't even go into an argument. He simply says, salvation is of the Jews. And, and, and by the way, God can save you too. And now that begins to change the subject and, or move the subject on because notice verse 25, that while the woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she says, there's one thing I know. One day Messiah will come and one day Messiah will teach us. Now this may be an attempt to evade him. She may be saying something like, you know, I have some time. I can wait. I don't need to do anything. I'll just wait on him coming. And that's when Jesus in verse 26 said, I who speak to you am he. This is the most plain statement that he's made up until this time. Nowhere did he speak of himself more directly, even to his disciples. Here he is saying, I am Messiah. And he made himself completely known in a clear and unmistakable way. Now this is what you call a call to decision. He's saying, I who speak to you am he. But by saying that, he's also inferring, what are you going to do? This is the clearest he could possibly be. He's simply saying, I am he. Now, as he's doing that, verse 27, at this point, his disciples came. They marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? As Jesus issued the challenge, the disciples came. They're taken by surprise. You see, a rabbi speaking alone with a woman was considered improper and um, unbecoming. Somebody said, he is talking in public with a woman, which was directly contrary to the rabbinic precepts. The words of the law were to be burnt rather than taught to a woman. A man should not speak in public to his own wife. That's why Marie and I. <laughs> but that's how it was at that time. Shouldn't even speak in public to his own wife. Doesn't get a chance to anyway. She's busy talking to him. But anyway. 
But notice in verse 27, no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? In other words, this is, this is someone you, 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 you aren't to have a prolonged conversation with. It's improper. It's unheard of. And you need to remember, she's a Samaritan. Now, they were used to, to Jesus ignoring the conventions of the rabbis. And, and because of that, they say really nothing other than that. Well, in verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now, we'll look at that for a moment. In leaving her water pot, she's actually leaving a promise, a promise that she's going to return. And she left. She ran to her village. And she spoke to those who would speak to her, the men. Now, when witnessing our faith, we always speak first to those who will hear us. When you have somebody who's willing to listen to you, that just opens the door of opportunity. Sometimes we think, oh, I want to reach this person. So you wait, and you don't share with others, because that person becomes very important to you. You need to speak to the person who's available, to the person who's willing to listen. And that's basically what is taking place. This is the first thing a believer is to do. When you come to Christ, make him known to other people. And notice what she says. He told me all things that I ever did. Now, in saying that, you, you can add to that, if you will. He told me all things that I ever did, yet he was still kind to me. Could this be Messiah? Now, this is what prompts us to share our faith about Jesus. It's a natural response of encountering the grace of God. Why do you share your faith? Do you share your faith? And if you do, why do you do it? Why did I and why do I share my faith when given opportunity? Because God has been good to me. Because I encountered God's grace. Because I became enraptured by his love, captured by his goodness. I don't share my faith because I'm forced to. Nobody forces me to stand up here in a, in a platform behind a pulpit in, a, in, in a, a way where I'm constantly fighting coughing because I, I need to cough and I can't. Why, why then do you, do you do it? Because I've encountered Jesus Christ. And when you encounter Jesus Christ, you tell people about him. You tell your friends. You tell your family. You tell those who will listen. That, again, is the heart of the Jesus movement. Always was, always will be. To take this faith that has been handed to us and to give it to somebody else. In the book of Luke, in chapter 8, verse 39, <laughs> there was a man of the Gadarenes who Jesus had delivered. And Jesus speaks to this man and he says to him, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Listen, guys, a lot of times people think it's difficult to witness. And it really isn't if you actually are simply walking in the spirit and walking with the Lord. It really isn't that difficult because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If the Lord is moving in your life, you're going to find ways to speak about that to other people. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to uh, invent opportunities. They're presented to you. And people will speak to you, and they will listen. And, and I realize that today in the society that we're living in, people think that, uh, oh, nobody's going to listen to us. That's not true at all. There are many people right now waiting to hear somebody tell them the truth. There, there are a lot of people who, who have never really met an honest and real Christian. What they've seen is on TV, the caricatures of Christians. Maybe they've turned on television and they've seen some loud preacher and some crazy outlandish garbage going on on a stage. And, and they say to themselves, if that's Christianity, I don't want that. But you know what? They may not know that you're a believer and you're a pretty normal person. And as a normal person, you speak to them. And I've had them say this to me. Perhaps you've had it said to you too. They'll say, you're not like those other ones. 
You're not weird like those other ones. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that, but I certainly don't think that when God put his Holy Spirit in me, he said, I want to make this one weirder than he already was. <laughs> but sometimes people act weird and scare people. My mom and my dad were driving uh, many years ago now. They were in uh, Upland. They were driving uh, north on, on Euclid. <coughs> Excuse me. And as they were driving, they stopped at a stop light. And this young woman came running from one of the streets, from the side street, came running, running and started banging on my mother's window. And let me in, she's screaming, let me in, let me in. And so my mother thinks that she's being attacked by somebody. So she opens up the door and this young woman jumps into the back seat and says, get me out of here. So my mom and dad drive away and mama turns around and says to the woman, young woman, what's wrong, baby? Now, my mom's going to think that some man is beating me or they're trying to rob me. She's waiting to hear something like that. And the girl says to my mom, she says, I was just in this church. And they're the craziest people I've ever been around <laughs> in my life. True story. True story. And my mom tells me, she says, I wonder what she'd have done if I would told her, well, you know, I'm one of them. She'd have probably... <laughs> She'd have probably jumped out of the car. But see, that's real. I mean, those things actually happen. Where people are around things that are so outlandish and so weird that they say, I wouldn't want anything to do with Christianity if it makes you be like this. And so, you know, God saved you. And God transformed you. And God filled you with his spirit. And God gave you his grace. And God forgave you. And in all of that, God humbled you. And so you're not proud, and you're not arrogant, and you're not obnoxious, and you're not totally opinionated. You, you listen with an open ear and an open heart, but you have the truth you want to share with people. I'm telling you, if you remember that, there are a number of people who would appreciate your ear and your heart as you present the gospel. A friend of mine, when he goes out with his friends and all his family, when he goes out to eat, he says very often the, the waitress or waiter will approach him and he's, he, he will say to him, we're about to pray and give thanks for, for our food. Is there anything that we can pray for you about? He said, you'll be surprised at the amount of people who will say, you know what? I'm going through some real, real problems right now. Going through a divorce, just lost my kid. He says, you'll be surprised at the opportunities. He says, if you just ask the question. And so just love the Lord. And when God does something in you, be willing to share. And Jesus is doing that. And Jesus is ministering. And this woman's immediate response is to not only hear, but she also goes out. She leaves her water pot. She goes to the man. And she says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now, <laughs> excuse me, verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you, you do not know. And therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? These, these guys are real sharp. <laughs> and, and Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Jesus is saying, I have a greater passion than simply satisfying my natural hunger. My greatest passion, my deepest hunger is proclaiming the message of the gospel and seeing people saved. So as he's speaking this way, the men are spiritually dull and they take his words literally. They completely misunderstood what he was saying. Now, when we've gone through John, you'll note that this is the normal response to things that Jesus says. Earlier in chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, remember Jesus had said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And his hearers thought he spoke of the literal temple. In chapter 3, verse 4, when he was speaking to Nicodemus, he said, a man must be born again. And Nicodemus asked the question, how can a man be born when he's old? He took it literally. 
In chapter 4, verse 11, Jesus had already spoken concerning the, the, wa the water and all. But the woman at the well said, well, hey, how can you get water? The well is deep. They took it literally. So this makes it clear that we do not always look beneath the surface to discover deeper truth. When it comes to the words of Christ, it's important to seek the deeper things. Jesus says something, and you'll see something on the surface. That's where meditation and pursuit come, come to play. You see it on the surface. When I'm reading the word, though, I'll say, what is it that you're actually saying? It goes deeper than this. I want to take it literally where it's literal. I'll interpret it in that way. But is there something deeper you want to show me through what you're saying here? Very often that's true. That's why Paul in Ephesians 1.18 prayed that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened so that we know that there are deeper things that God has for us. And so as this is taking place, and they're saying, has any, anyone brought him anything to eat? Verse 34, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Remember in Luke chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He's saying, I've been sent on a mission. My satisfaction is derived from completing it. Nothing will get in the way. I am single-minded, and I will finish it. It's like what it says in Hebrews 10, 7. Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. But then he says in verse 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields. They're already white for harvest. I'll give you an application in a moment. There are those commentators who say that what Jesus is saying here is a proverb amongst the Jews during that time. They say it because in verse 35, Jesus says, do you not say there are still four months and then comes harvest. So they'll say that was a proverb during the day that people understood in terms of the, uh, the need of the moment. Other commentators point out something interesting. They say this is actually giving to, to us the time or the month that this event is taking place because the harvest usually is in April. So there are commentators who say what Jesus is saying is this, and he's saying it in January. They're saying he's giving the time here. John is saying this took place in January, and Jesus is simply saying, are you not saying that you have four months until harvest comes? The point that's being made is what I want to develop right now. The thought is, you may think there's no hurry to harvest the crops, but I'm saying that it is urgent. Do not delay in seeking to see people saved. You need to have a sense of need. If you go into the church's main sanctuary and you go into the, uh, the hallways that we have, and say you walk in and you look to the left, which is the north, and you go down that hall. Many of you have never done this. But if you were to go down that hall, you will see a timeline that we have that is there for you to track the history of this church. Some of you have seen it, probably most of you, but some haven't. And you'll see all the way from the Jesus movement all the way up to the construction uh, that we've had of property here. And if you look, you're going to see our first bulletins, one of the first bulletins that we had. We have always had, as a symbol of this church, wheat. We always have. And that symbol came out of this scripture, John 4, 35. And the reason that we have that scripture as a foundation stone of our church is because I believe that we have a very short time and that we should be busy being about our master's business. That we have friends, and we have family, and we have co-workers, and we have people we go to school with, and we have neighbors that perhaps we've met who don't know the Lord. 
And what Jesus is saying here is he's saying the time is short. Don't think that you've got a lot of time. Get busy doing God's work. I've spoken to our, our staff on many occasions, especially in the earlier days of this ministry. And I've said that there are times that God will use visible things to stir us spiritually. So Abraham is told by the Lord, look at the stars. And when you're out there in a, in a, in a, a desert in the Middle East, and there are no clouds, and you look into the sky, there's especially all those hundreds over thousands of years ago. You got Abram looking up into the sky, and it was a sea of stars. And God used that in his mind to give him an understanding of the amount of descendants that would come from him. He said, look at the grains of sand as another illustration to awaken him to the reality of many descendants and I believe that the Lord very often will use physical things to give us spiritual lessons. And so he's speaking to his men, and I've told this to ours. And I've said, look, the, the fields are white to harvest. And, and we, we need to get into the labor of that field to reach those people. We have to be careful. I, I, I've said this to, to um, staff members before and pastors. And I've said it like this. I've said, one of the easiest places to backslide is in full-time ministry. It's a safe place. It's a place where you, you, you know you've got an office. You, you, you know you've got a job. You know you've got a paycheck. You know you have all of those things. And you forget that fire that was burning in your heart that put you in the place in the first place to be used by God to reach people. And I, I'm growing older. I know that. But I haven't lost the fire because I want people saved. I want people to know Jesus Christ. That's how it works. And that's what it's supposed to be like. That's what it's supposed to be like. That you see people in need. And, and you reach out in whatever way. You can help them sometimes physically, of course. You can help them sometimes financially, of course. But, but, but they can eat and be hungry the next day. They can drink and be thirsty the next day. That's why Jesus said, he says, he says, he who drinks of this water will thirst again. But the one who drinks of the water I give to him will never thirst again. Because he gives to us something that quenches that spiritual thirst in our lives. And somebody who says, I have Christ, but is still thirsty for something else. I have every reason to wonder whether they really have tasted of the Lord and seen that he's good. Because when you taste of Jesus Christ, you never thirst for anything else. Again, when I got saved, you know, I encountered people. It's amazing how, how all of a sudden people were worried about me, my soul. So now I have Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on the door. Now I have uh, <laughs> guys into reincarnation talking to me about God. Mormons talking to me. It's interesting because they're trying to steal the seed that had been planted in my heart. But when I got saved, man, the first thing I did is I went across the street and I, I told the mother of, of a friend of mine, we were supposed to get loaded, her son and I that day, he was gone and I had gone and gotten saved. And I, I went across the street and I told his mom and I told his sisters about Jesus. I went across the street. I spoke to my mom. I spoke to my dad. I, I spoke to my sisters. And I started speaking to people about Jesus. Why? Because it, it, the, it, the time is short. And because the, the fields are, are white for harvest. And, and there are people out there who are perishing without Christ. And we need to have that in our heart. I think that the church today has gotten very, very lukewarm. And very, very content. We have to watch out. Because I believe that there's a... A, a dazed condition in the church today. We, we need to be reignited in the things of the Lord. We need to understand that without God, people are perishing. And Jesus was speaking in John 3, verse 3. Remember how he said to Nicodemus, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There are friends, their family, their co-workers, neighbors, and strangers in need of the Lord. Not everybody sees the need. 
Not everybody has a burden to share the message. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There's a great need, and not many people wanted to meet that need. But God help us to be men and women who will meet that need. God help us to see the need and be willing to get our hands dirty as we serve him. In verse 36, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. Ministry is a team effort. No one individual does the entire ministry by himself or herself. Every time I minister and every time I give an invitation, I am simply joining in the labors of others. Whenever I teach, there are people, even now, who are praying for me as I'm teaching tonight. They go, there's a room that we have in the sanctuary, and there are men in there praying for for you and for me right now. On Sunday morning, every Sunday morning when I'm teaching, you may or may not know this, there are men who are in a room praying for you and praying for our church. I realize that we need a team to reach the world. We need people who join together and work together to reach this world. Ministry is a team effort. No one individual does the entire ministry by themselves. Paul made it very clear. Paul had to deal with comparisons. There were people in, in Paul's time who were saying, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, I'm of Jesus, I'm of Paul. And they were breaking the body of Christ into little subgroups. And Paul was upset about that because that's carnality. When you start placing a man above other men, that, that's a dangerous place to be. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord. Sometimes we think, well, if, if, if the great evangelists would come and share with my family, they could be saved. We think that. If I take people to hear a great evangelist, name whatever evangelist you want to name, maybe they'll get saved. You know, when Billy Graham was still alive, if Billy Graham, if only Billy Graham could speak to grandma, she could get saved. You know, I mean, we can say today, uh, Greg Laurie, if Greg Laurie would just stop by, maybe my mom and dad could get saved. I learned a long time ago that every one of us is intended by God to do what God called us to do individually. I didn't rely on Billy Graham to speak to my dad and my mom. He never would have. I was supposed to. God had saved me. And I've said this before. You already have a Billy Graham in your house. It's you. If God has saved you and given you his word and has filled you with his spirit, why can't you be used? Why can't you communicate to people the goodness of God? All you need to do is live what you give your family knows you. They see the changes. My dad told me that. He said, David, he said, when you told me I was going to go to hell, he said, I thought, well, he says, I'm better than my son. And he was. He says, but I'm not better than my daughter, Madeline. See, my daughter, my sister Madeline gave her heart to Christ the day I got saved. My sister Madeline, I've said this before, my sister Madeline was that 16-year-old who would sit with popcorn in between mom and dad and watch movies and never went out on dates. She was a teenager, and she was the best girl you'll ever meet in your life. She married her first boyfriend. I mean, she, she, was, she was so perfect, I hated her. I mean, she was a, <laughs> she, she was a good, good girl. I mean... <laughs> The, the, the good girl. And he said, I knew I was better than you, but I, 
I knew I wasn't better than her. It was her life that he saw as this is a good person in need of Christ that stimulated him when the bad person who had been changed challenged him with the gospel. God can use you. Why isn't he? When's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When's the last time you encouraged someone to know Jesus Christ? Well, you know what? When God gives you opportunity, step out in faith and share. You might just blow your mind at how God uses you. You might become addicted to it. You'll be a doper for Jesus, you know, <laughs> preaching the Christ. You'll be a dope for Jesus, if you will. A fool for Christ. Somebody once said, you know, everybody's a fool for something. I'll be a fool for Christ. And so what we do is we share, and that's, that's what happens, you know. And God works with people, and, and he uses groups and all of that. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him <laughs> because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Now, then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we, are, we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed from there, went to Galilee. Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast for they also had gone to the feast. And so, as they see a, as they, as they behold a sea of white garments approaching that has been reminding him of this great harvest, and on the strength of her testimony, many of the men came to believe in Christ. They believed he was the one she was saying he was because they also were looking for Messiah. Well, in verses 40 and 41, when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay because they wanted to know more. So they prevailed on him to keep teaching them. You see, when you get saved, receiving teaching is a top priority. And as this is taking place, notice others joined, others listened, and others were getting saved. So in verse 42, they said to the woman, we believe not because of what you said, but because we've listened to ourselves. You see, we became interested in Jesus because of your testimony. But it's his word that has saved us. Her testimony produced curiosity, but his word produced salvation. And that's why we preach the word and not simply our testimony. And so after two days, he departed, verse 43, and went to Galilee. So he resumes his trip to the north. He already was on his way to Galilee. But it's interesting, and I want to look at this for a moment before we close. <laughs> Notice verse 44. Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Let me sh share with you about that for a couple moments here. Jesus testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. I'll give to you Bible and application to it. Jesus was in a synagogue in Nazareth where this took place. And while he was in this synagogue in the north, in Nazareth, he had been challenged to perform works to prove himself to the people. They had heard him read scripture and say that the scripture was fulfilled in him. And they began to speak amongst themselves. And they said, this is Joseph's son. He's only a carpenter. And so Jesus had challenged them by speaking out loud what they were thinking. He had said to them, surely you're saying within yourself, physician, heal yourself. What you've done in Capernaum, do here. So Luke tells us in chapter 4, verse 24, that Jesus, in response to what was taking place, said no prophet is accepted in his own country. So in the context of John, Judea was the place where the temple was located, and that represents the center of rejection. So Jesus has left the south to go north. 
And that's the whole point he's making here. He's alluding to what had taken place in Nazareth. Now, let me give you an application. I used to say this when Billy Graham was alive. I've mentioned him more than once, so I'll mention him again one more time. When Billy Graham was a young man and he was ministering and he had a young family from the early 50s until his last message, Billy became one of the most famous evangelists who ever lived, who ever lived. He was well known. All anybody had to say to this day is Billy, Billy Graham. And everybody knows who that is. Whether they loved him or hated him, they all knew what he stood for. I can still remember a true story of a, of a reporter who was on vacation in Africa. He was on a safari. And he was on one of these trails. And there was a vehicle in front of him. And the vehicle in front of him stopped and started to try and make a turn to turn around and, you know, come back in the direction of this guy's car. And, and he shouldn't have done that. It's a one way. And so the reporter starts honking his horn at the driver in front of him and stuck his head out and yelled at the driver. And he said this, I'm quoting the, the reporter, where are you going for Christ's sake? To his surprise, the driver was Billy Graham. <laughs> and Billy Graham stuck his head out of his window, and he says, I go everywhere for Christ's sake. So he was, he was very well known. He was a very well-known man. People knew Billy Graham. Handsome man, tall man, distinguished man. If he walked into a room, people would show him respect. Presidents listened to his counsel. This man was the most respected Christian. He was one of the top and most important people who ever lived, according to various surveys, including Time Magazine and others. One of the most important men the United States ever produced. But do you think that his kids knew him as Billy Graham? I would say no. They knew him as Daddy. I am sure that when his children were small, that they smarted off to him, that they would disrespect him, that they found opportunity to disobey him. I know that because I read Franklin Graham's biography, autobiography, in which he states that he was a real bad kid. Did he know that Billy Graham was his father? I doubt that he understood the magnitude of this man and his ministry. As a young person, he certainly didn't. As an older man, yes, he did. Now he has nothing but understanding. But as a younger man, no, he didn't. A prophet is without honor in his own home. That's a fact. You can be well regarded in various places. People know you and respect you. But that doesn't mean that the people of your own house respect you. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. You may be somebody big in the church and you do a lot of ministry and people regard you highly, but your own parents think that you're wasting your life doing the things that you do. Your own kids think that you're keeping them from having a good life because you don't allow them to do the things that their friends are doing. And they don't like you and they don't like what you stand for. A prophet isn't always honored in their own home. Very often, they're not and even in churches, there are, there are men I know who are men of character, who love God, who love his word, who are filled with his spirit, and their own churches don't regard their pastor. That's a natural thing. That's how people are, is they have a tendency of not respecting and not seeing the gift that they have. And Jesus himself, Jesus himself said a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. And there he is in Nazareth, and there he is doing works. And they're saying, well, the works that you've done other places do here. And in Luke's uh, gospel, when he speaks about that in chapter 4, they took Jesus to the brow of a hill to cast him down. That's how they respected him, and that's how they responded to him. 
And so don't be surprised when people don't think that you're a very important person. Don't be surprised. And don't run around trying to be one, by the way. But don't be surprised when they don't regard you. Because in many cases, they don't. They didn't even regard Jesus himself. You see, Jesus never performed miracles to satisfy curiosity. Jesus performed miracles because they had a purpose. And I'll close with this. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, <coughs> John will say, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. The miracles were intended to bring people to faith in Christ as Messiah. So when they said, do a work like you've done in Capernaum, no, Jesus wasn't there doing miracles on demand. They had a purpose, and that was to draw people to know him as the Savior. So we'll stop here, and we'll pick up next time in verse 46. Again, thank you for your patience with my coughing. Hopefully, one day it'll stop. I'm sure it will when they throw me in a casket. But anyway, <laughs> then you'll be sad. <laughs>